Today, a very special episode. Stories of gear made for the outdoors, grassroots style, and built in the garage. The special characters who make our favorite gear come to life. People are passionate about outdoor equipment. Get this. Americans spend more than $20 billion a year on gear. But no one ever really sees how their stuff gets made. Well, that's where we come in. Each week, we throw open the factory doors and give you a behind the scenes look at how your favorite gear is made. Made for the Outdoors is brought to you by Borderview Lodge. Hey everybody, welcome to today's special episode. I want to share with you a couple of my favorite stories from over the years. These are stories about characters who build some of our favorite outdoor gear. Not necessarily the big dogs, but people who build with passion. What we call our In the Garage segments. And up first, the story of Jesse Gerhard, a veteran who came home from war and needed to find inspiration. He found it in the back alleys of the big city. A couple more boards there. Curiosity drives Jesse Gerhardt to the back alleys of the big city. I know where three spots are to go. Where this outdoorsman loves to hunt. I'm going to steal those ones right there for sure. That's like an old, like, door or something. I do like these little pieces. These are solid wood. I wanted to tell a story about what people thought of as trash that someone with some skill could make it new again. Jesse makes the rounds behind businesses he has permission to snoop. I thought this was a thick, thick piece. You can take and cut it into a lot of strips. Big discovery. Score. Sounds like this. Score, score, score. <laughs> but a picker's pleasure. This feels like oak. I can't tell. Also creates pain. Oh, am I going to be able to lift this? Around railroad tracks and in industrial parts of the city, there, there's just a lot of lumber everywhere. You can end up fr framing like a whole house out of all the wood you can find, you know? This is a story all about habitual hoarding and its positive effects. I got this strap off of a truck holding MREs on it when I was in the invasion of Iraq. See, Jesse survived three tours of duty as a Marine Corps machine gunner. He came home after war to try and find clarity and maybe a new direction to be able to pursue something that was not uh, uh, really difficult on my body uh, because I, I, I can't move around as good as I used to be able to. Jesse built on his lifelong hobby and earned two degrees in woodworking. By the time I was done with college, I had all, enough tools to make a living. So we set up shop literally in an old Northeast workshop. It is here his story finally took shape. I find wood wherever I can get it and make stuff out of it. Mostly people's fences and wood flooring, people's dresser drawers. Yeah, so it's all recycled wood. A business that started with a single canoe. 90% of this is all church pew. The deck here is a cedar fence uh, from Robinsdale. This is that James J. Hill lumber from Delwa. It's that part of that gym floor. And then the waste from the canoes I make into the paddles. The waste from the paddles a lot of times I make into the fishing nets. The waste from that I make into fishing lures. So these are all little cutoff pieces from when I make a Canoe paddle. Jesse's form of recycling, a practice well perfected. Just look around.
turns out this passion whittled its way out of Jesse's family tree. Yeah, it was from my grandfather back before it wasn't even the Boundary Waters. Jesse's grandpa, an outdoorsman larger than life, the mentor who taught Jesse to love life outside. Jesse quickly became a chip off the old block. Some of the stuff I make is, if my grandfather were to see it, then he would be excited. Everyone is. Hello. Hi. How are you doing? Jesse's show booths never stay empty long. And they're all from someone's fence that fell over in Robbinsdale. I keep saying someone's. It was actually my fence that fell over. <laughs> this was the first prototype, and definitely my favorite type of paddle to paddle with. Who knew one man's treasure could come from so much trash? Show people that somebody with some skill could take what all other people thought was trash and make it into something that was good enough to even pass down to their children. A strange thing to think about that it was in the dumpster and then I made something out of it and people hang it up as a piece of art. Made for the Outdoors is brought to you by Borderview Lodge, Ice Castle Fish Houses, Aquarius Home Services, Car Arms, and by Keystone Light. Keystone Light, always smooth, celebrate responsibly. Up next, the story behind this very simple piece of outdoor gear. These fish-inspired hats have grown the artist's reputation to almost rock star status. You got a filter for this? Jeff Trodal would never paint any sort of picture that he's much of a fishing pro. I got one. That just isn't his style. <laughs> For real? Oh, it is real. It is real. But... Yeah. Need help with that? Jeff's love of these little <laughs> critters led to a change in life's brushstroke. To understand is to tour Jeff's basement. These are uh, all concert posters and, and album covers that I did over the years. Jeff always loved illustration and art. After graduating with a degree, he made a career creating art for some of the biggest bands in the rock biz. This poster, the very first poster when the Grateful Dead came back. But even in his rock and roll lifestyle, an old song called Jeff Home. My life has been in the woods and camping and fishing and at some point in life thought I needed to be in the rock and roll business. The picture of life got a little bit bigger and clearer. I realized that's not what it was all about. Jeff eventually started fishing trout streams out west with some of his closest friends. In moving water, Jeff found inspiration. But these have all kind of grown out of different hats that I've been doing for bands. Something like this will sit around long enough to turn into something like this. Painting fish hooked Jeff. To look like a fish is fun. It's all, it's all we're worried about. Some of them I've, I'm directly aiming for the species of the fish. Other ones I, I like to take the artistic freedom of creating my own fish. All right, almost done. This artistic outlet led quickly to near rock star status. I never thought anybody else was gonna be that interested in it. Knock on wood, they go real quick and people really seem to attach to them. Scott Sorensen considers himself a troll dog groupie. Yeah, um, really fun guy and uh, creative. Scott owns the fly fishing shop up in Grand Marais. He sells Jeff's custom hats when he's lucky enough to get his hands on a few. They're quirky and fun and creative and 
you know, I guess it's similar to the art of fly tying in that it's a way to get you through the long, cold winter. For Jeff, painting wildlife runs deeper than that. Much deeper. See, Jeff and his wife now own his parents' old house. When they moved in, Jeff discovered treasure in the shadow of a dark closet. I found this painting my father did. Like this little painting is, is more valuable to me than anything I've ever done. Turns out Jeff's dad, a lifelong corporate man, had a creative side, just like his own son. I don't know how or what, but somehow it overly inspired me to start this, I guess you could call it owl campaign or I, I, owl direction. These owls, I, I can't stop. Jeff's funky outside the box art. A colorful diversion from his professional world of the music business. And in some way, it's his most important work too. And that owl was kind of the first window to just start back into doing things I wanted to do, instead of working for everybody else all the time. So if you ever see Jeff on the dock, don't be too tough on him. <laughs> he can't always pull a big fish out of the hat. He, he, he belongs on a hat. I haven't done a perch hat yet. But he sure knows how to put one on it. You're getting a perch hat. Guaranteed. <laughs> Made for the Outdoors is brought to you by Spire Credit Union. Moen's Mouse Mix. Polaris Industries. Warner's Dock. Game Fair. You know, paddle boards have been quite the story about the last decade or so. Tim Shore decided to build his own version of a board. It is an act that would profoundly change his life. Okay, so Minnesota might be the land of 10,000 lakes. Makes sense that people want on the water exactly why after a full day of work at the local bank tim shore oh little man steals a quick smooch and sneaks into the garage time to cut some wood safety first i'm going to basically cut this in half and then i'm going to strip it down i should be able to get eight strips completely out of this board this wood will become the DNA of Tim's dream. It started back in 2013, and my wife, Jen, wanted a paddleboard. It really what it all boiled down to, and I started doing some research. And I just fell in love with them, fell in love with the look of those type of boards, and I, I told Jen I'm gonna make her one. 200 hours later, we had a board. And a vision for a business. Hand-built boards made out of, well, boards. A first. Tim rips red cedar strips, which will become the deck and the board bottom. When I cut up that other board, it'll be a book match cut. So when you lay it out, it will be identical on both sides. As you can tell with these two knots, very similar. It just gives a very uniform look all the way down the board and very symmetrical. He saw smaller pieces of aspen and polonium. They will go in between the cedar strips. Think accents and added color, a steady hand, and plenty of focus to get the cuts just right. So now I'm gonna basically take the cedar that I cut up along with this aspen and glue up a panel. The panel. Tim actually builds several. Once put together, they will become the board top and the board bottom. This panel I'm gonna be gluing up is either gonna be on the right or left side of the board. A lot of this will essentially get cut off do an accent strip like that. So what I do is I tape the boards together just so they stay together. Next, on surfboard stands. Lay the panel up here, let the seam come off the edge. And he grabs the wood glue, lots of it. So then you just run your seam and now the glue is gonna be held in by the tape on the other side. Tim fills each joint. 
and Tim drops the panel into wood clamps and ever so gently tightens each. Throw a couple different weights on there and then just let the glue dry. Heck, it's getting late. Time for bed. But after the break, Tim burns a few calories. Made for the Outdoors is brought to you by Canvas Works, Polaris Industries, L&M Fleet Supply, Tim Shore's day job might be banking, but he really cashes in on his true passion at night. Tim sneaks off to the garage to build paddle boards. He first cuts and glues together the board tops and bottoms. A little sanding, and they look like this. Ready to be glued up. So I find what's the better side of the two, this one being it. That will be the bottom of the board, and then this is gonna be the internal bottom of the board. Now come internal board ribs and spars. I designed these kits, the 11 and a half and the 10 and a half foot sup, and they basically start as a skeleton. Like the kits you got when you were a kid, little balsa airplane, you just pop them out and <laughs> put them together. That's kind of what I like in it too, because it literally takes about five minutes. To... Crazy considering building the skeleton on the very first board took more than 100 hours. Yep. 100. I try to shave weight as much as possible. The whole kit, when it's all put together, weighs two and a half pounds. They definitely look flimsy, but when you get it all together, it really builds strength. Tim builds the frame in three sections and then joins them with epoxy. Tim lines up all three skeletons. He uses small gussets to connect each section. This whole structure stays glued up overnight. It's time to join the frame to the board. The main thing is to get that center stripe pretty doused with epoxy. Yeah, you really want to have it sitting in epoxy and have it harden as much onto that wood as possible. Tim lines the skeleton along an epoxy center line and then heavy lifting. Plain old cinder blocks hold the epoxy parts in place. Basically try to do three at a time. Tim uses a riser to create the perfect bend on the back of the board. Suddenly, you can see how strong these paddle boards become. So basically, this board started out as two by six by 12 cedar boards, as well as one by three Aspen. Glued them up as panels, and we had a top and bottom panel that are identical. He builds edge rails. And you glue the nose and tail on, and you got a fully solid board. After sanding, a few last cuts. So basically I'm cutting the fiberglass down a little bit. It's kind of excess. This is a 38 inch wide roll. The board itself is only 32 inches in width. So I'm just cutting the excess off. Now it's ready for the glass. Fiberglass, the board's protective cover. Two to one ratio. This step is very crucial because you want to make sure that it's measured correctly. If you don't mix the epoxy and the hardener correctly, you will run into a gooey substance that never gets hard enough and then you have to sand the entire board off. It's not a fun process. Well, we all learn from our mistakes. I use a fast hardener from the time of mixture. It gives me about 30 to 45 minutes before it really starts gooing up and you're not able to move it on the board. Which means quick hands. The art is to get it evenly covered. He uses a squeegee to rub out air bubbles and also compress the fiberglass right to the board. As the final product starts to dry, it sure looks like Tim has it all figured out. You know, my goal for the year is to build about 30 boards, but next year I hope to double that and just increase production. It's one at a time right now. It's cool, man. If you would've told me I was gonna build stand-up paddle boards like five years ago, I'd have thought you were crazy. First of all, I wouldn't know what they were. This whole process, it's amazing how things have kind of came together. Just worked out, all the way down to the name. Oh yeah, a name. That must have been the tough one to figure out. 
I don't think it's a fad. I think people are gonna find ways to get out on the water and this is a great way to do it. I don't see it going away. Great stuff, Tim. Although I have to share a story with you. That piece initially aired back in 2017. And after it aired, Tim actually took a very strange phone call. Somebody said, hey, I wanna buy you all new gear and buy you a new facility. The only thing you need to do is quit your day job. It was one of those angel investors who had seen our story on the air. Tim said yes, and his business has exploded. They make paddle boards, they make wakeboards, and even long boards. Now, that is why we are in business. Such a great story. Hey, until next week, we will see you back here with new gear made for the outdoors.